We can't close the gap in healthcare until we gain more empathy. And in medicine, doctors lack empathy because we don't think of empathy as a teachable skill. And so many of us who are practicing medicine, we're burning out. And I'm gonna talk about how design thinking can help physicians develop the skill of empathy. I'm gonna share my own burnout journey and how I'm trying to close the gap between people and health through teaching design thinking to future doctors. And this is where we teach our classes. Um, it's called the Health Design Lab, and it's literally located in the vault of an old bank. When you're at um, university with limited space, you take what you can get. And so our medical students come here and they tinker and prototype and they dream of wild solutions in healthcare. And here they're testing a hospital mattress that they have a customized sensor on to prevent uh, pressure ulcers in hospitalized patients. And we like to take medical students and residents, our faculty members out of the hospitals and clinics and put them in here and we have them participate in design thinking workshops. My own journey to become a physician starts with my parents and they were dreamers. They immigrated to the US from South Korea. They worked in flea markets and gas stations. Uh, my mom didn't get a chance to go to college. My dad had to drop out, uh, but they wanted me, the firstborn son, to become a physician. <laughs> but this is me. I wasn't the brightest kid. I was actually a bad kid. I didn't get good grades. I was actually bad at math, and being an Asian male, it's kind of weird to say that you're bad at math. <laughs> uh, but I persevered and managed to make it through medical school. And after training, I took my first job here. It's at an academic medical center in Philadelphia. And a few years into my career, I started to experience symptoms of burnout. Uh, I felt angry, uh, emotionally exhausted, uh, really kind of depressed about my career, cynical, and I didn't feel like I was making a difference in the lives of my patients. And some of you may feel this way right now. And nearly 60% of us in emergency medicine experience burnout. It's the highest rates of burnout of any specialty. And what causes this? So the studies have shown it's the endless mountain of bureaucratic and administrative tasks electronic medical records, uh, feeling like a cog in a big machine. I think it's because healthcare is like the Borg. And for those of you who, are, who don't watch Star Trek or who are too embarrassed to say they're Trekkies, the Borg was this collective of cyber organisms that assimilated their enemies. And this was their favorite threat. And in medicine, I think many of us experience a sense of futility uh, we lose the soul of doctoring and we get crushed by the pressures of the healthcare system, the pressures of increasing revenue, improving patient satisfaction scores, getting my charts done on time. And I review a lot of applications in medical school and trust me, no, no uh, aspiring doctor says they go to medical school to become an RVU maximizer. <laughs> to close the gap in healthcare, I I think we need to change the recipe of how we make physicians. And at my school, I'm hacking this recipe by teaching design thinking. And doing this is actually helping me regain some of the idealism I had when I was a first year medical student. And for the first time in a lot of years, I started to get optimistic that actually, actually could fix some of the problems that we see in healthcare. And it was this process of ideation and rapid prototyping that made me feel less powerless and less burned <coughs> out. Design thinking unlocks the creative side of our brains and creativity became imprisoned through the long years of medical training, the endless memorization of facts and regurgitation of them. And this process of human-centered design really gave us the freedom to come up with wild ideas. A lot of them weren't great, but in proposing wacky solutions without fearing criticism. And design thinkers and designers, uh, they say weird stuff, like fail fast and often, and they encourage a bias towards action. And for those of us who are clinicians, uh, this mindset is very foreign. Doctors hate to fail. We quickly jump to solutions based upon our own expertise, and we are reluctant to think outside the box. We love to invite uh, patients into our workshops. They give us new insight and inspiration. Uh, they're really the experts of their disease. And here's a patient with a cancer diagnosis and he's sharing with us 
his story of how scary it was to come to the hospital and receive radiation therapy. And listening to these narratives helps to build our empathy for our, our patients and really inspires us to design better experiences for them. In design thinking, we love to form how might we statements. These statements open up the opportunity for us to design a solution. And let me give you an example of an application of a how might we. How might we help Larik to be healthy? Larik is a teenager who was tragically shot while standing on his friend's porch in Philadelphia. And our medical students empathize with Larik. They took a deep look into the barriers and challenges of a patient living with a disability. And Larik wanted to do things like he wanted to go back to school, he wanted to regain the ability, ability to write, and he wanted to do the activities that he loved, like uh, playing video games like any teenager does. And as a doctor who works in an emergency room, I don't get a chance to step inside of the shoes of a patient and really see what life looks like for them outside of the hospital. And it's a struggle for Larik just to make it outside of his home. This, is, this ramp to his front door, it's literally an obstacle course. It takes two people to get him to the sidewalk safely. And Larik challenged our assumptions about health. Uh, being health was more than just accessing the health healthcare system or not getting sick. Being healthy for him meant doing the things that he used to do before his injury. And as we learn to develop empathy for individuals like Larik, we also work to empathize with specific communities like this one in Kensington, Philadelphia. And this park has a reputation for being one of our most violent neighborhoods. Shootings happen here right in the middle of the day. But if you travel three miles south to where those tall buildings are in the background, that's where my hospital is. And life expectancy increases by almost 20 years. But in this zip code, in this park, people die at an earlier age. Your zip code is the strongest predictor of how long you will live. It's a much better predictor than genetic code. And in Philadelphia, there is a 20-year life expectancy gap by zip code. Another example of an application of a how might we, we asked ourselves how might we design healthier communities. And to do this, we partnered with a nonprofit organization that operates a farmer's market in that park that we just saw. And because that organization already has a relationship with that community, we were able to go in there and um, set up this pop-up stand where our team of medical and pre-medical students, they're obviously the ones with the red shirts, uh, they can engage with real people. And, and our students asked residents in that community what their community needed to be healthier. And people loved sharing their insights. They wrote them down on sheets of paper, and we took their responses and turned this qualitative data into an awareness campaign. And these health insights were shared on social media platforms like Twitter and Instagram, and they really gave a voice to people in that community. I think designing healthier cities begins by empathizing with people and communities. It's a critical step for humanizing the data around health disparities. And to move the needle in healthcare, we need to pivot away from delivering sick care. And I think I was getting burned out as an emergency room doctor because I felt I was just treating the complications of diseases instead of making people healthier. And I wish med school looked a little bit more like this, that people, that students would get out into the communities and engage with people and organizations outside of the hospital. And I think the treatment team of the future needs to go beyond our traditional healthcare actors. Our treatment team needs community members, caregivers, community organizations, designers, and city planners to combat the injustice of shorter lifespans. People should not be destined to die at an early age because of which zip code they were born in. And in medicine, we talk a lot about large sample sizes, big data, better outcomes for populations. But to me, these data are often dehumanized. And building empathy allows me to better understand the human experience behind the numbers. And when I get frustrated by how much our healthcare system sucks sometimes, I try to focus on the sample size of one. And when I reframe uh, problems in healthcare using this approach, it makes it less overwhelming. Uh, problems and solutions don't seem so daunting when focusing on trying to help just one person. 
But this is what most of us are going to look like on Monday morning. We feel like we've been assimilated by the Borg, and we're going to go back into our big healthcare machines. But how do we develop a how might we mindset? Uh, last spring, we had a chance to hang out with Jim Kenney. He's the mayor of Philadelphia. He's the one wearing the Green Eagles t-shirt. And here's my colleague, Rob. Uh, he's always hustling, and he's sharing with Mayor Kenney the story of Larik. And Mayor Kenney, like any good politician, asked how he could help. So Rob explained that Larik needs a better ramp because of a loophole in his insurance coverage. He can't get it. Um, and I, with my cynicism, cynicism, didn't think anything was going to happen. But a month later, Larik got a brand new motorized wheelchair-assisted ramp to his house. And now it's so much easier for him to get in and out of his home. And uh, remember when I said Larik just wanted to play video games? Well, our med students took that to heart, and they hacked a game controller for the Nintendo Wii so Larry could control the buttons using his head. And so for the first time since his injury, Larik was able to play video games uh, by himself. And I believe that incremental changes like this giving one teenager in Philadelphia the chance to do what he loves can help us to close the gap in health. And I challenge us all um, to change our mindsets when we go back into the big healthcare machine on Monday morning. Think about how you can complete this how might we statement for your community and how you can close the gap between people and health. Thank you.